Okay, so you sobered up, you passed the bar, and that's when you started your whole environmental enforcement lawsuit and, you know, what basically carried you on for many decades. Yeah. What really was the motivation to really go after people that were ruining the environment? Well, you know, I always, uh, I, first of all, I was always an outdoors person. And that, you know, my father raised us. We were doing whitewater kayaking on the biggest, you know, rivers in the country from when we were really young. And this was a time when people, you know, normal people were not doing whitewater. It was before it became kind of, you know, something that people do on weekends. It was a commitment. And, you know, I was fishing from when I was a little kid and I was training hawks from when I was nine years old and hunting with them. And, uh, and so I was like in the woods all the time. And I, this is where I felt the one place I felt calm. And I, when I was a kid, they, you know, the, the Eisenhower's highway program was kicking off and they built a highway right next to my house. They built it through the pond where I was fish, catching frogs and fishing. And, you know, they just plowed it over. And I was like, this is like theft. They just, you know, they just ruined this place. They stole it from the public. You know, we, it was, uh, and, and that's how I, you know, I, that's how I viewed environmental injury. I, I, I viewed it as a theft, a theft of the common, a privatization of the commons, of the things that, you know, we're all supposed to share, like air, water, wildlife, fisheries, public lands. The law says, and this ancient law it goes back to the Code of Justinian, these assets that by their nature are, you know, the assets of the entire community that you can't privatize are not susceptible to private property ownership, air, water, wildlife, fisheries, public lands, aquifers, national forests, all these. They belong to the people. Everybody has a right to use them. Nobody can use them in a way that will diminish or injure their use and enjoyment by others. Under the Code of Justinian, which was the law, the first kind of effort to, to, uh, at constitutional government, if you were a citizen of Rome, you, whether you were rich or poor, humble or noble, you know, African or, or European, you had an absolute right to cross a beach, throw in a net, and take out your share of the fish. The emperor himself couldn't stop you. And that was just one of the rights of living in a republic. And what you see is that when democracy and a a republic declines, their powerful entities within society will immediately move to privatize the public trust. And that's what pollution is. It's a way of private, I mean, General Electric, the, the Constitution of the state of New York, says that all the fish in the Hudson River belong to the people of New York. Every kid in New York, every you know, black kid in Harlem has an absolute right to, to throw in a plug and pull out a striped bass and bring it home and feed it to their family. But they can't do that anymore because General Electric privatized every fish in the river by dumping PCBs into them so they're now too dangerous to eat. So they, you know, they, in order to, to avoid one of the costs of bringing their product to market, and they dump their waste into the Hudson and they privatize every fish in the river. And that's what all pollution is. Somebody privatizing the air that my children, you know, I had four kids with asthma. On bad air days, um, they got a tax. So their, the air was being privatized, stolen from them. And that's how I always looked at it. I, and I... Uh, um, you know, I went to work for commercial fishermen on the Hudson River and recreational fishermen and figured out new ways to start suing polluters. And, you know, we built this organization called River Keeper um, into, you know, we helped restore the river. And today, the Hudson is an international uh, model for ecosystem protection. It's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces uh, more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean north the equator. It's the last river system left in the North Atlantic that still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish. And the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of river keepers and water keepers all over. We have one here on Santa Monica Bay. We have Each one has a patrol boat. We have 350 organizations. Each one is a patrol boat. They each have a full-time paid waterkeeper, and they sue polluters and, uh, and enforce the law because it's illegal to pollute. But the law doesn't get enforced, so that's what we do. 
And we're now the biggest water protection group in the world. Well, you said that poor communities get most of the burden of mm-hmm. environmental pollution. Yeah. You said polluters always choose the soft target of poverty. And you've also said that uh, Chicago Southside has the highest concentration of toxic waste dumps in America. Yeah, uncontrolled toxic waste. That, yeah. You know, that's my, the, my first case was representing NAACP um, of Austin against the city of Austin, which was trying to put a waste transfer facility in the oldest bad black neighborhood in Austin Valley. And when I started fighting that case, I started looking around and saying, oh, this is what always happens. You know, four out of every five toxic waste dumps in America is in a black neighborhood. The highest concentration of toxic waste dumps um, is in, in, you know, in the country is South Side Chicago, the biggest Waste dump in our country is Emile, Alabama, which is 85% black. The most contaminated zip code here in California is East LA. And you go, you know, you can go on and on with that, you know. And probably the biggest, you know, problem in the, in the black community is, uh, you know, our, our chronic disease and, and toxins that are poisoning this generation of kids, you know, including 44% of, of black children in urban areas have dangerous levels of lead in their blood. Um, they're getting mercury toxicity. It lowers IQ and it, it uh, destroys your executive function, your capacity to regulate your own behavior. Um, you know, a lot of these toxins, uh, make kids ADD and ADHD, and they have a lot of other damaging impacts. Well, in 1994, you married Mary Kathleen Richardson. You guys had four kids together. In 2010, you guys got divorced. In 2012, she ended up committing suicide. According to reports, it said that she had found a personal journal of yours where you had written down various encounters, sexual encounters with 37 different women. And that possibly triggered her to take her own life. Would you care to comment on that at all? (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, you know, it's hard. First of all. I'm sorry for your loss, by the way. This is your your mother, Um, your kid's mother. Yeah. I mean, I, um, you know, I was not divorced at the time, by the way. I filed for divorce in 2012, but, um, you know, Mary was having a hard time. And I actually, in 2014, when she took her own life, I, I found her and, you know, and uh, I cut her down. She had hanged herself in our- You our, actually our, found her like that? Yeah. Wow. Um, but, and, you know, it was a hard, heartbreaking. And, you know, I had a lot of, um, my children at that time were very vulnerable and they had been through five years of very, very difficult um, times. And the, Mary was an amazing woman. Um, and she was a very, very good mother to them. Um, but her, uh, her mental condition began deteriorating. Um, and, uh, you know, in those last years, and they, those kids experienced a lot of that. And, you know, all of those kids, I think, were at risk at that time. They've all turned into amazing, amazing kids. They're all on, uh, they all do well in school and colleges. They have wonderful friendships. They have wonderful relationships. And they, um, you know, they've excelled in their lives, which is a miracle. And I'm very grateful to um, my wife, Cheryl, who became a mother to them. Um, uh, just so that, you know, I would say this in all cases that um, people uh, uh, who are healthy and have, you know, have um, a strong, uh, who are strong emotionally, no matter what other people do to them or what other people's behaviors, they don't take their own lives. Um, and I'm sure many of the things that I did uh, hurt marry in different ways. But, uh, people take their lives for complex reasons and because of mental illness. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, one of the, I, in, in the program that I'm in, the, the journal that you're talking about was called, is called Your Fifth Step. Oh, so it was part of the drug treatment yeah, journal? Yeah, it was part okay. of my, uh, it was part of my, uh, you know, my recovery. And yeah, I, I was wondering I, why someone would write this down. <laughs> well, I didn't write, it also was, there weren't like names of people and all of those, they, you know, in the, in the way that the, 
newspapers reported that to make it look like, uh, you know, it was keeping a, you know, kind of a, you know, notches on the trigger. That's right. not what it was. It was uh, my own, um, you know, way of, of trying to live and examine life and struggling with an issue that I was struggling with at that time. And I kept that fifth step in a safe and somehow uh, in her, in the place that where she was, she put a lot of effort into getting that safe open and then handing that to her sisters with instruction that if anything happened to her, it should be published in the press. And then shortly after that, she took her own life. Oh, I, you know, it's a tragedy for, you know, I, listen, I take responsibility for my own conduct. Um, and, uh, I, but, you know, it was part of a long history of, of um, you know, of difficulty. Yeah. And for a lot of people.